I just want to thank God for the band. Didn't they do? I mean, I, I love that we can add new people to the band. <laughs> they, you guys are great. Appreciate you guys jumping in there. Thank you so much. It really does add a lot. I love to see new faces involved in these kinds of things. So, Mom, now you can go ahead and start the video. Meet Kelly. She's super happy, loves life, and can't get enough of it. Okay, not really. She's miserable, goes to bed around 8, and sings angry 90s rock songs with her cat. Now meet Dylan. He's outgoing, loves adventure, and is super athletic. Yeah, his last adventure was grilling frozen hot dogs on his patio, listening to his 78-year-old neighbor tell it like it is. What do they both have in common? They're both miserable. But they found each other on DateMiserablePeople.com. Now they're not so miserable, although Kelly still sings with her cat. Begin your journey on a miserable today for free at DateMiserablePeople.com. I am not necessarily endorsing this dating service, um, <laughs> but it does sound like an interesting idea, doesn't it? Uh, th the concept is just that, you know, we, act, we often act like we're happy, that we have our lives together, uh, but the truth of the fact, I mean, we all know that none of us do, at least we, I hope that we all know that. None of us have our acts together, and none of us are perfectly happy and healthy all the time. So why don't we just be honest with each other? Why don't we just accept each other for, for who we are um, and if we're honest with each other, it can actually lead to a happier, healthier life. In other words, if we confess our sins and our suffering, we might actually be able to be redeemed and rescued from our sins and suffering. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, as I was working on this sermon, uh, Abby came up to me overwhelmed with schoolwork uh, and, and overwhelmed with the messy condition of our house, um, obviously implying that I should help uh, clean the house at that moment. Um, I told her that I, I was working on this sermon, and I, I couldn't just stop doing that. And before I stopped working on the sermon to help with her overwhelmed um, condition, I told her that first I needed to think of an illustration about suffering and redemption. And without missing a beat, she said, I'm suffering. I need you to redeem me. It, it did work. I, wrote, I quickly wrote down that illustration and helped clean the house. Um, this sermon is about suffering, but even more so, it's about redemption. It's about how not only does God have a purpose for suffering, but how, in the end, God rescues us from our suffering and even increases our joy in eternity because of the suffering that we may endure in this fallen world. Romans chapter 8 verses 18 through 25, says this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves, who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is not or but, but, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? For we hope for what we do not see. For if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Let's pray. Father, help us to be patient. We don't always understand the reason for our suffering. So help us to trust in you. Help us to hope in, help us to hope in Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, my favorite children's book is Love You Forever. <laughs> the rest of my family thinks it's creepy because it's about a mom who creeps into her adult child's window, even, uh, even into his bed, and in order to rock him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, while singing to him, I'll love you forever, 
I'll, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. Well, I think it's beautiful, but mom, don't get any ideas. Um, I recently learned about how the author wrote this story, and I think it makes it even more beautiful. According to the Huffington Post, there was a children's book. Uh, before it was a children's book, it was a four-line poem that the author, Robert Munch, would sing silently to himself after his wife gave birth to a second stillborn baby. He would sing to himself, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Munch says that the song was too painful to sing out loud. For a long time, he couldn't even share it with his wife. He would cry just thinking about it. After the, the second stillbirth, doctors told the couple that they would never be able to conceive again. The couple went on to adopt three children, but Munch used the song as a way to grieve their two previous losses. Um, he would sing it to himself like a silent lullaby, never writing it down or saying it aloud. Then one day, speaking in front of a crowd, the song popped into his head, and he made up a story, the story of the book, right on the spot to go along with the song. Some people in the audience thought it was dark and creepy, and some thought that it was a beautiful story about unrelenting, unconditional, never-ending love. And everyone thought it was unlike any child's story that they had ever heard before. Now, maybe you'll disagree with me about how this relates to my message this morning, but it's definitely true that out of great suffering comes beauty. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says that God has made everything beautiful in its time. Well, our passage in Romans chapter 8 this morning immediately follows verses 16 and 17, which we talked about two weeks ago. It says this, The Spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children also heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. You know, we can suffer many things in this life. And we do. We suffer many things. We suffer because of mistakes and sins that we personally commit. Uh, we suffer because of sins that people around us commit. Uh, we suffer, we, we even suffer just because of the general presence of, of sin in the world. Um, but, but the type of suffering that Paul is writing about in this passage is suffering because of our faith, our faith in Christ as we identify with him, being God's children. See, Jesus suffered. He suffered not because of any wrong that he committed, but because he took our sins upon himself when he endured the cross. Even as Jesus was doing the most selfless act ever to be done in all of history, uh, all of the history of the world, forgiving us of our sins, he also endured the greatest suffering ever to be endured throughout history of the world. And Paul invites us to suffer with Jesus in order to be glorified with Jesus. Is that why you suffer? I mean, really think about it, because sometimes we like to justify ourselves and make ourselves the hero who suffers for unjust reasons. But think about why you're suffering. Why, why are you suffering? Obviously, we can't die for the sins of the world, because only Jesus is the Savior. And yet, God calls us to follow Jesus. So when you think about why you suffer in the world, can you trace it back to loving people, being selfless, as Jesus was loving people and was selfless? Or does it go back in one way or another to sins that you've committed? If we're honest, most of our suffering is on us. Now, there's obvious examples of this, like drugs and crime, which each have consequences and suffering as a result. But, but there's also things like procrastination, laziness, which also lead to consequences and suffering. But God calls us to suffer for doing good. He calls us to be willing to share the gospel with those around us, no matter what the consequences may be, so that the people around us can trust in Jesus and be saved. 
But if we do that, I mean, if we're living this selfless life, trying to point other people to Jesus, many of our friends are no longer going to be our friends. We're going to suffer. Many members of our own families will no longer want to be around us. We share the gospel with them with nothing but love, but it's often received with contempt. So we suffer. But I want to point out that Paul actually seems to broaden this view of suffering as he writes verse 18 from our passage this morning. He writes in verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. So yes, as I've been talking about, we, we ought to be willing to suffer as Christians, right? But Paul actually writes, uh, writes this about all suffering. He, he could have written, uh, this is what he could have written to make it more clear. Uh, I, I, could, I, could, I consider these sufferings, referring to the con- these sufferings, the kind of sufferings that he had just been talking about, verses 16 and 17. Or he could have written, I consider uh, suffering with Jesus is not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. But that's not what he wrote. He wrote, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, he's saying all the sufferings that we endure, all the sufferings, whether we brought it upon ourselves, whether somebody else brought it upon us, whether we're suffering for the sake of Christ, all of our suffering is not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed to us. So reflecting on suffering in general, Paul wrote that this suffering, that God's glory is going to so be so much greater than anything that we've endured. So what does that mean? It means simply that life is hard, but God is good. Life is hard, but God is good. When you think about all the things that you've endured and may endure in life, whether you brought them on yourself or not, or whether they came about through the hands of others or not, we can look forward to a time when God's glory is going to be revealed, and all of our suffering is nothing in comparison. We get so consumed in this life sometimes about relieving suffering. Relieving the suffering that we face or we've brought upon or other people have brought upon on us. On a small scale, for example, if we're hungry, we can easily, in our culture, get food, right? If, if we're thirsty, we can easily get a drink. But even on a larger scale, if we see an injustice in the world, we can work to relieve that, and we should. We can send money to organizations that help children in poverty. We can donate to cure cancer and things like that. And and there's certainly nothing wrong with those things, and we ought to be doing things like that. Um, In another place, Paul wrote to slaves that if they could get their freedom, they should do that. And yet he also wrote to them that it was even more important that they endure with patience. And if they were going to suffer, suffer for doing good. Now, slavery is an injustice, and it's kind of beyond the text that we're talking about this morning, but slavery is an injustice, and we ought to not repeat the past. And yet, when this life is over, we'll all be able to look at all the sufferings that we've endured and be able to say, God, seeing your glory revealed makes all that suffering seem like nothing. Seeing God's glory revealed means seeing how God has a purpose, and that God's purpose was was revealed through everything, even our suffering. In the end, we'll be able to look at every hard moment of our lives and be able to praise God for working through everything for our good and his glory. Verse 19, for the creation eagerly waits with anticipation For God's Son to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. You see, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we we have been marred by sin, right? And when we sinned, even creation was marred. Creation itself began to suffer. Um, Because of Adam and and Eve's sin, the ground was cursed. Plants started producing thorns and thistles, things that are harmful to the touch. We have things like tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes, because when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, their sin affected everything. So creation 
longs to be relieved from suffering. Look at verse 23. Not only that, but we ourselves have the Spirit as first fruits. We also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope. Because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Man, we would love in this life to get everything that we've always wanted, right? <laughs> We'd love to have, at least that's the way we think. We think that we, we want everything that we've always wanted. We think if, if we just got everything that we've always wanted, we'd be happy, right? But Paul is saying, if you get everything that you've always wanted, you have no reason to hope. In this life. If you, I mean, he's saying if you, if you get everything that you see that you think that you want then you have no reason to hope. But we hope for what we don't have, what we don't see, and we eagerly wait for it with patience. So, we groan with creation, but there's good news. God has a plan to redeem creation and all things. It's interesting that it says that we eagerly wait for adoption, even, even though last week we saw that we've already been adopted by God. So we see this concept, again, of already, not yet. We've already been adopted by God, and yet we wait for our adoption. Um, this is a reality that we see popping up in Scripture a lot. The, being adopted by God means, in part, that we will have perfected, glorified bodies. We'll shed all the limitations of this life, and we'll be like Jesus, because we'll see him as he is. And this is something that we eagerly wait for with patience. Today on the church calendar is known as Palm Sunday, uh, which is actually quite fitting for our, our message today. Um, on Palm Sunday, Jesus was welcomed into Jerusalem by people waving palm branches, right? But those palm branches needed to be cut off of trees. And those trees were groaning with creation, longing for the fulfillment you see, even creation welcomes Jesus, longing to be restored by Jesus in the end. Out of great suffering comes beauty. And this is definitely true of Jesus himself. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The poet and author Dorothy Sayers said it this way, Whatever the reason God chose to make man as he is, limited in suffering and subject to sorrows and death, he had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine. Whatever game he's playing with his creation, he has kept his own rules and played fair. He can exact nothing from man that he has not exacted from himself. He has gone, he, he himself, he has himself gone through the whole of human experience, from the trivial irritations of family life and the cramping restrictions of hard work and lack of money to the worst horrors of pain and humiliation, defeat, despair, and death. When he was a man, he played the man. He was born in poverty and died in disgrace and thought it wealth or worthwhile and thought it worthwhile. And Jesus did this out of love for you. Jeremiah 31, verse 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. In other words, I think God was telling Israel and, and us, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Robert Munch wrote these words for his dead babies. And you know, the Bible says that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. The difference, however, is that God has the power to raise us to life. That's what the resurrection is all about. Jesus was risen to life so that we also can be raised with him. Not dead in our sins, but alive to Jesus, alive to God through the Spirit. So although we suffer now for a little while, by grace through faith in Jesus, we're redeemed and given a new life. God makes everything beautiful in its time. Have you 